Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. It is June 15th, 2017, and I am your host, Chris Martinson. The world has pinned so much of its future hopes and dreams on making a smooth transition to alternative energy. This means mainly solar and wind power. Now, of the two, wind power has the very best economics and, more importantly, energy returned on energy invested profile. Now, given this and all the headlines you've probably read about the huge and massive inroads that wind power has made, I have a pop quiz for you. In the last full year of data that we have available to us, which is 2014, so it's a little old, but that's our last full year of data, rounding to the nearest whole number, what percentage of the world's total power was supplied by wind? Was it 20%, 10%, 5%? Actually, trick question. The answer is actually 0%. And that's because wind actually supplied just under 0.5% of total world power in 2014. So rounding to the nearest whole number brings us to zero. Now, this year we can expect that number to climb to 1%, I guess. But the, the point I'm making here is this. The world and all of its various geopolitical balances and economic activities require energy. Lots and lots of energy. Now, where we source that from matters a lot. And it's past time to get serious about how we are going to replace finite fossil fuels. Hundreds of quadrillions of tasty, tasty fossil fuel BTUs with something else. Now, I happen to think that nuclear power generally and thorium reactors specifically can and should be a very serious part of that conversation. And I first began to take seriously this idea of thorium reactors back in 2012 when we had on this program Kirk Sorensen, a proponent of thorium reactors. Kirk began his work with thorium while working as an aerospace engineer at NASA. And in 2010, he left NASA to work as the chief nuclear technologist at Teledyne Brown Engineering. In 2011, he founded FLIBE, F-L-I-B-E, a company focused on developing modular thorium reactors. Now, as I have said at many points in my writing and my presentations, my book, heck, every chance I get, we do not need any new technologies to be discovered. There are solutions already on the shelf that we have to get serious about using. Maybe they need some development, but they're there. So welcome back to the program, Kirk. I can't wait to talk to you about this really important subject. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be back. I've really enjoyed talking with you in the past. Well, myself as well. And, and so let's, uh, let's start here. You know, I, I did open with this idea that um, as excited as people are about alternative energies, when we really don't confuse ourselves between the difference between electricity and power, because a lot of times you see these headlines that say Costa Rica supplied 100% of its power with alternatives. Uh, not the case. They supplied 100% of their electricity for a period of time. But when we look at the total power mix, all the things that power our societies, alternative energies are still really small percentages of the overall mix. We're going to have to begin um, making much, much larger inroads. Let's talk about nuclear. I know a lot of people are, are uh, you know, particularly after uh, Fukushima and, uh, and maybe for other reasons, seem to think nuclear is dead in the water at this point in time. I happen to think it's got to be an important part of the mix going forward. Where do we start on this? Let, let's, start with, let's start with nuclear itself. Um, certainly the industry seems to be uh, in trouble at this point in time. We've had bankruptcies, a lot of concerns about the waste that comes out of the light boiling reactors. Where are we going to put that stuff? And uh, it's an aging industry at this point in time. What's your take on the nuclear industry at this stage? Well, you've assessed it correctly here. We are at, at a point where, where many changes are going on, and, and uh, I feel like uh, some of the notions that people like me have been putting forward for many years and have been considered radical are now beginning to become more mainstream in thought, like that the future will not necessarily be 
based around water-cooled, solid-fueled reactors. Uh, the issues that associate with that in the public's mind primarily are safety and waste. And that's somewhat unfortunate because the nuclear industry really does have an admirable safety record. And I can only contrast this with pretty much every other energy generation technology, including uh, wind and solar. That said, though, nuclear has a unique ability, uh, and I'm sure the media gets a lot of credit for this, to terrify huge segments of the society in ways that no other energy source seems quite capable of. And for that reason alone, people have come to associate a nuclear fear with it, which is really unfortunate. There is also this issue of nuclear waste, the thought that these reactors are producing waste that is dangerous and will have to be sequestered for human activity for periods of time that seem beyond their comprehension, thousands, even tens of thousands of years. And it's not hard to see why people would think, why are we using this energy source that seems to create long-term problems and seems to have a safety issue associated with it? And to me, the answer is very simple. It is because nuclear energy alone has an energy density millions of times greater than the chemical energies that we currently run our society on. And this is because in nuclear energy, we are releasing the energies that bind together the nucleus of the atom. And those energies are millions of times stronger than the energies that bind together the electrons of the atom. Those are the energies that are released in chemical energy uh, systems like fossil fuels or digestion or combustion or anything along that way. And more importantly, there's nothing in between. There's no thing that we're going to do that's going to have a thousand times improvement or something. It is a step function to go from chemical to nuclear, and I see it as a moment of societal evolution when we truly realize the benefits of nuclear energy. Now, we decided long ago to pursue a particular direction in nuclear energy that was recognized from the outset had safety concerns and had much larger waste production than had to be done. And we are now reaping, I think, the consequences of having made that choice about 60 years ago. So there is an opportunity now to say, let's back up in our minds a little bit and look at some of the other nuclear technologies, namely thorium, namely liquid fuels, that didn't have these potential problems and were known, like you said, from the very beginning. They were known about in the 1940s at the dawn of the nuclear age. And to say, isn't it time to consider some of those technologies and the advantages that they could bring to these problems that we see before us now, because it really doesn't look like our current suite of nuclear technologies is going to be appropriate for us in the long haul. Well, now let's talk about some of that history, because I, I don't want to maybe cast judgment here, because uh, people made different decisions once upon a time. But as I look back and understand the nuclear industry in the United States, it, it's a it's a it's a two pronged story. One we get power from nuclear too, we get weapons from nuclear, and those were conjoined for a long period of time. And so if you could just break down for people, um, you know, when we say nuclear, it's not just one thing. It's not like when we say, uh, you know, gasoline, that, that's a thing, right? Um, nuclear has a lot of different ways that it can be pursued. It has a lot of different um, uh, reaction cycles. So if we could just start to parse this out so people can understand that this is somewhat complex territory, but what are the big pieces? How, when we say nuclear, what are we talking about? Yeah, let me let me try to break that out. And, and, and let me perhaps correct a misconception here. Actually, there is no example in the United States uh, with, with one that really deserves an asterisk, with the exception of one that deserves an asterisk next to it, of when we used a reactor to make material for weapons and electrical power. Actually, what happened was just the opposite. In the beginning, Reactors existed only to do one thing, and that was to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. The energy of the reaction was simply thrown away. These were the big reactors that were built after World War II at the Hanford Reservation in Washington and also at the Savannah River plant in South Carolina. And because people were aware that this enormous expenditure of money was going forward to make material for nuclear weapons, and yet energy was just being thrown away, there was a, there was a, a real effort in the early 1950s amongst industrialists who thought, my goodness, this should not be the case. We should, we should create uh, dual-purpose nuclear power plants that could do both. And they started and they tried to do this. They 
they got together and they built a nuclear power plant in uh, Michigan called the Fermi-1 plant. It was a fast breeder reactor, and it was originally intended to make material for nuclear weapons and nuclear power simultaneously, and it had a very unique design. But that is not what ended up really being the predominant form of nuclear energy in the country. The predominant form of nuclear energy in the country came from the work of Admiral Rickover, who was trying to build a reactor to power a submarine. And it had certain limitations on it. It had to be very small, had to be very compact, uh, had to be... Uh, had to utilize highly enriched uranium. And he built that reactor successfully in 1953. And then the decision was made that we are going to build larger power plants based on that design. And this decision was widely opposed by the scientific leadership of the nuclear community, even in 1953, for the reasons we just talked about, safety, waste, and so forth. But it was pushed forward because there was a strong need, particularly by the Eisenhower administration, to show that we were using atoms for peace that we were actually doing something with nuclear energy other than making material for nuclear weapons. And so they built a reactor in Pennsylvania called the Shipping Port Reactor, and it was the first one to produce power for the grid. It was very expensive, though. It was not a competitive power generator. But based on that initiative, there was a belief within the utility community that the path had been chosen, that we were going to use pressurized light water reactors with solid fuel as the nuclear reactor of the future, even though these reactors did not make material for nuclear weapons. And that was how a technological lockdown took place that has been widely documented and also widely lamented that put us in this scenario where we were building a, a submarine reactor on the land for the next 50 years. This is what we have today in the United States is we have approximately 100 of these land-based submarine reactors producing electrical power. But they also produce a lot more waste than you would like to see. They are only getting about one half of 1% of the energy of that uranium fuel that is loaded into them out as useful energy. And so most of that material ends up as waste and that's unfortunate and it's a fundamental drawback of that particular implementation of nuclear. So. That's kind of how things happened, was there was an initial push for reactors that made plutonium for weapons. There was a push back saying, no, we also need reactors that could do both. And what, but that wasn't what actually happened. What actually happened was Rickover's submarine reactor got put on the land and became a fleet of civilian power generating reactors. And so here we are with those 100 plus uh, reactors. And, and so some of the um, criticisms around them is the waste. Some of this waste has to be buried for 10,000 years or more. It's it's very hazardous stuff because of the the waste products. So again, we're talking about a fission reaction, um, a nuclear material uh, starts a fission reaction. Things atoms get split apart. Some of those are relatively harmless byproducts. Some are very harmful byproducts. Uh, and and so in that solid waste that uh, from that solid fuel, you end up with with uh, useful energy comes out and a lot of waste gets left behind and then you have to do something with that. So most of that waste right now is actually stored on site at a lot of these reactors because we don't have a long-term repository uh, uh, designated yet. Uh, I think the Yucca Mountain thing is stalled as far as I know. So waste is a problem and also the design of these things that, that they operate at, at very high pressures so that if something happens as we saw uh, in Fukushima when when uh, they couldn't cool them appropriately. There were buildups of, of pressures, uh, sometimes explosive gases. I don't even know what happened with Reactor 3. That thing torched with a, a, quite exothermically. But anyway, there was a, a, a vast release of material into the atmosphere at that point in time. What, I, what I'd like you to do, Kirk, though, is talk about, though, this is a design, but there are lots of other possible designs out there. There are lots of other ways to skin the nuclear cat. And I'd like to start peeling those back so that we can understand that 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 the decisions made 60 years ago um, were, were, are not the same ones we might make today. 
Yeah, and let me let me start with with where we are now because that's the best way to understand where we could be. The choice to use pressurized water was a very intelligent choice for a nuclear submarine because pressurized water was a material that could actually slow down neutrons in the smallest space. So it led you to the smallest and most compact reactor. In a submarine, emergency coolant is available everywhere because you're in the ocean. So there's no real worry about, am I going to run out of coolant? That's not going to happen. The challenge came when that submarine reactor was moved onto the land where you were no longer immersed and you didn't have emergency coolant everywhere. Another choice that was made was they had to deal with the fact that water and the nuclear fuel were not chemically compatible. So they had to put a material between them called a clad and it was made of a zirconium alloy and this clad protected the water from the uranium and the uranium from the water. Well, that zirconium alloy at a particular temperature will exothermically react with water. And this is one of the things that happened at Fukushima. It's called uh, – uh, yeah, it's essentially that, that metal turning into uh, a ceramic, zirconia, and it rips the oxygen off the water and it leaves hydrogen and the hydrogen can explode. And that's what we saw there. So choices were made in terms of material compatibility that we would not exactly go, wow, that was a great choice. So one of the things that I find very, very exciting about the kind of reactors we're working on at FLYB is the materials choices from the beginning reflect choices that are chemically stable with one another. We use three things in the reactor. We use a, a nickel alloy, we use graphite, and we use fluoride salt. All three of those exist in a state of material compatibility with one another. They touch each other, they contact one another, they don't have any possible reactions. And that's very, very important. So. By making different choices on coolants, by making different choices on fuels, you can eliminate categories of problems that exist in today's reactors that simply can't exist because now you've taken away the thing that made it happen. Well, let's talk about uh, thorium as a, as a nuclear fuel uh, just to get everybody on the same page here because, um, you know, we say nuclear people are thinking uranium or maybe uh, plutonium. So thorium. First, uh, uh, what what is what is thorium, and uh, what is a thorium reactor as your uh, company Flyb is is uh, imagining it? Okay, thorium is a naturally occurring material. It's about three or four times more common than uranium. If you were to go outside and pick up a rock, very likely there's thorium in it. There's probably some uranium too. Could be detected with a Geiger counter. It has a very long half life, about 14 billion years, and it is responsible for the majority of the heating that takes place inside the planet Earth. And this is the heating that keeps the Earth's core molten, that drives the magnetic field, and that drives plate tectonics. So I'm fond of saying geothermal energy is just thorium with a bad heat exchanger. Hmm. So thorium is nothing unnatural. In fact, it is very natural. And the heating from the radioactive decay of thorium is, quite frankly, what's kept our planet livable for many billions of years. Now, you mentioned waste a little bit earlier. Why do we get such poor utilization of uranium? Is it because we're you know, not intelligent people or we're not trying very hard? No, there are some physical limitations to using uranium. Part of the problem is there is a small fraction of uranium that is fissile. And there's a much larger fraction of uranium that is fertile, meaning it can be converted to a nuclear fuel. When we talk about nuclear waste, the, really the waste isn't the materials that have been fissioned. It is the materials that absorbed neutrons and became long-lived materials like plutonium. That's unburned fuel. Today's reactors make plutonium as they consume uranium, but they don't make enough plutonium to make up for the uranium they consume. And so that's why they can only obtain that small fraction of energy release, and that's why the waste contains the plutonium, the 26,000-year half-life, that dictates isolation from the biosphere for many tens of thousands of years. Ideally, you'd want a reactor that didn't make the plutonium and could burn up all of the fuel. And that's what thorium lets you do. Thorium, it, properly utilized, will produce enough new fuel to compensate for the fuel that is consumed. The fuel that's used in a thorium reactor comes from thorium. It's called uranium-233. It does not occur on Earth, but you can make it 
by bombarding thorium with a neutron. It becomes uranium-233. And then as uranium-233 is consumed in the thorium reactor, it emits neutrons, and most importantly, enough neutrons to continue the conversion of as much or more thorium into new uranium-233 as you used. By utilizing thorium in this manner, you can consume essentially all of the thorium while not making any of the long-term waste, any of the uh, plutonium and so forth. And by having all of the uh, material chemically processed and recycled. So that's really, at its heart, the essential benefit of thorium. You have to have a system, though, that is capable of executing these chemical processing systems, these recycling systems, and that can utilize thorium correctly. And that's where this salt-based technology really shines. And this was recognized by Alvin Weinberg, who was the head of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the 1950s. He saw that this salt-based technology that they were working on was going to be the right technology to make it possible to utilize thorium. And he supported it. So the <clears throat> uh, uh, demonstration reactors uh, got stood up uh, back then. And, and the basic idea here is that um, existing in a, in a liquid salt form, which is a very hot molten salt, but in a liquid salt form, you have a, a reaction that's uh, basically cycling from uh, thorium to uranium-233, which gets consumed. It liberates heat in a fission process. And if you run that long enough, uh, you end up with uh, consuming nearly all of the fuel that you put in. Instead of that 1.5% yes. you mentioned for conventional or what we would call a conventional nuclear reactor, we might be burning 99%. And, and so uh, that's part one. Part two is that because it's in a liquid salt form, it's circulating and you have the opportunity to do processing on it live while it's going so that if there are products uh, uh, developing waste products you would have the opportunity to remove those uh, and, and keep this continuously operating without having to take the whole thing apart lift all the fuel out put new fuel in, uh, in on a regular basis as regular basis as we would see in a typical nuclear reactor and then I guess the final point is that all of this is basically operating at um, at what we would call normal temperatures, uh, sorry, pressures. Normal pressures. Normal yeah, pressures. Normal High pressures. temperatures, but normal pressures. Yes. Uh, and so because of that, if there was, say, a, a pipe springs a leak, it doesn't go, you know, go shooting off it, um, you know, spraying stuff everywhere. You might have something drip on the floor. Is that is that a fair assessment of how this, roughly how this design is, is conceived at this point? Yeah, and the, the most important part is that low pressure. That's a big differentiator between this and the water coolant. Water has to be brought up to very high pressure in order to prevent it from boiling. And even then, it can't go much higher than about 300 degrees Celsius uh, before you reach a point of just what's called supercriticality. So that's why we have to operate water-cooled reactors at high pressure. It's basically inevitable. Well, why do you have to operate at high temperature? That has to do with converting uh, the, the heating energy of the reaction into power, and that's general to all power systems. doesn't matter what it is, solar, wind, coal, gas, whatever. We have to run at high temperature. So high temperatures is unavoidable. That has to be in there. But high pressures is avoidable, and we can design systems that are based on coolants that don't have to run at high pressure. The beauty of the salt is it doesn't have to run at high pressure because it's so chemically stable. It doesn't undergo any reactions. It doesn't have any pressure to worry about, and it can hold vast amounts of thermal energy. So you don't have to pump as much of it around to move a, a certain amount of power. And these were the aspects that Weinberg and his team discovered in the 1950s that made him think, why, yes, this is a good, good fit with the thorium fuel cycle. If we were to go and attempt to utilize thorium using this technology, it should work out very, very well. You mentioned the waste products. The most common fission product of a fission reaction is xenon, which is a gas. It is very easy for this xenon to absorb neutrons. And that is a problem in all reactors, is xenon just really, really wants to absorb neutrons, and that hurts the reaction. It takes some of the neutrons out of the reaction that would otherwise be helping it to proceed. In a liquid fuel, it's effortlessly easy to get the xenon out of the liquid fuel. It comes out just like, like, like fizz out of pop. So 
uh, that, that most important waste product that you would rather see uh, come out of your reactor is, is easily removable. And xenon rapidly stabilizes to a non-radioactive form in about 30 days. So it's not a long-term waste hazard. In fact, it's actually a rather valuable fission product. So that's another example of how the description you made of the system is very accurate. It is able to correctly and simply process the fluids while it is operating that allow the thorium uh, system to operate at, at, at peak efficiency. So uh, this is fascinating because, um, uh, you know, when I did some basic research on this, thorium is is a very common element. Uh, I don't even know how to begin calculating this, but it looks like it would be safe to say there's thousands of years of fuel sort of lying around if we were uh, to begin using this uh, technology, assuming we didn't want to... It would be safe to say there are billions of years of fuel lying around. All right. <laughs> so I wanted to be extra safe, I guess. And... Uh, uh, and, and so this clearly is something that, that could have a, a really important role to play. But let's let's cast back. I'm really interested in what what happened. Um, you know, Weinberg's got this this uh, dream. I assume you know from what I've read, he really understood uh, just how he, like he modeled this out and said this could be a really important uh, fuel source and energy source for humanity. Thinking it all the way through to how you could cluster. Um, centers of, of habitation around individual reactors, uh, you know, gar with, with uh, fertilizers and farming, all kinds of stuff. So he had a dream. Seems pretty compelling. And it didn't go anywhere. Why not? Well, the answer is, is, is fairly simple and, and a bit damning, which is that, as I had mentioned, a, a industrial consortium had formed in the early 1950s around the notion of a dual react uh, a dual uh, mission reactor, where it would produce power and plutonium simultaneously. And this was the fast breeder reactor, which was built at the uh, the Fermi-1 reactor outside of Detroit uh, in the early 1960s. And the man behind this was an industrialist named Walker Sisler, who ran Detroit Edison. And I, I'm actually very, very impressed with what he did, because he assembled an industrial consortium, and he got, at the time, humongous amounts of money from the various groups. So there was tremendous inertia to go forward on the fast breeder reactor into the 60s. The Fermi reactor was built and unfortunately under, underwent a meltdown in 1966 and, and really dashed his dreams. But nevertheless, so much industrial work had gone into that technology that the Atomic Energy Commission decided, okay, we are going to make building the fast breeder reactor our national energy goal. And they enshrined that in the mid-60s despite the failure of the Fermi-1 reactor. And they poured enormous resources into this. And they viewed Weinberg's work on the thorium reactor as an undesired competitor to the fast breeder reactor. He was receiving paltry amounts of funding from the Atomic Energy Commission, whereas the fast breeder was receiving amounts on the order of a hundred times greater. He argued that we really ought to continue with several designs just in case one of them doesn't work out. They didn't look at it this way. They looked at it like we don't want to distract congressional leaders or funding sources with a multiplicity of opportunities. So we just want to concentrate everything on the thing that we are advocating, Uber Alles. So they killed his work in 1972, but his warnings were very prophetic because the fast breeder reactor ran aground politically in the late 1970s under the Carter administration and was canceled. It was briefly revived under Reagan only to be canceled again in 1983, which would have been a very good time to say, my goodness, since we didn't end up building the plutonium fast breeder reactor, mm -hmm. perhaps we ought to go back and think much more seriously about this thorium reactor that was advocated as recently as 10 years ago. But it does not appear that that was the case. By this point, Weinberg was out of power. And I think a lot of the people that had worked so hard for it were just tired from the fight. I have searched uh, with great diligence to try to find any evidence of an effort to resurrect the technology in the early 80s. I've talked to people that worked on the program, and everybody just said, you know, they didn't want it, so we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest story in the book. You know, I had an opportunity to be presenting it uh, to a, a group of people from NASA a while back and working with them on a on a effort to envision the next hundred years. And of course, I brought up thorium uh, as a concept because you know when I give my little song and dance about where we really are in the energy story, the it's like, well, well then what would you propose? And I say, 
Bulthorium, and it's interesting that, that of these uh, NASA engineers in audience, most of them, their heads just tipped sideways. They'd never heard the term before. Um, you know, Clearly, I did not standpoint. succeed in my in my efforts at NASA to promulgate the notion. <laughs> <laughs> Big organization, what can I tell you? But uh, it's it's still relatively unknown. Now, I was I was interested, however, that in between the time uh, we talked last and now, the Electric Power Research Institute did a study and uh, performed a technology assessment on this idea of a molten salt reactor, specifically the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, the LFTR, or the lifter. Uh, talk to us about, first, who is the Electric Power Research Institute? How credible are they? And second, um, what did they find when they, when they took a look? Well, the Electric Power Research Institute is essentially the research arm of our utility structures in the United States. For many years, they had separate R&D organizations, and after a blackout that took place, I think, in the 70s, I, this is sort of the origin story of EPRI, there was a belief that, my goodness, we need to come together, we need to do joint research, and we need to make sure things like this never happen again. So if you want to do research in the utility sector, EPRI is the place you go. They speak for the industry. And so we were fortunate through a, a utility contact at, at Southern Company uh, to be able to undertake this study of the lifter uh, under the auspices of EPRI, uh, and that ran from about uh, 2014 to about 2015. And so it was an initial look at the, at the lifter concept. And I participated heavily in this, and, and so did Vanderbilt University, and uh, so did the Southern Company. And essentially, the results were it looked very promising. Now, the amount of time and effort that was undertaken on the study was modest by anybody's standards, but uh, compared to anything that had been done since the shutdown of the Weinberg effort in the 70s, it was by far the, the most substantial effort that had been undertaken on the, on the thorium molten salt reactor since then, at least within the United States, I should say. And the results were... Uh, no showstoppers. Uh, it looked like the technology was straightforward and could be developed into an operational system. A great deal more engineering was required, but it appeared to have the attributes and the and the uh, capabilities, responsiveness, safety, economy, compactness, uh, affordability that the utility industry was looking for. And so I was I was very pleased to uh, to see that uh, make its way into the final report. So let's paint the picture then. If, if, if uh, somehow funding happened and, and we progress forward, and obviously there's new development and, and uh, scaling and things that have to happen, but what would, a, what would a lifter plant look like? What would its footprint be? Um, you know, how quiet would it be? What, what sort of uh, 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 concerns might people have living near one? Uh, you know, all of those things. Because every power source, let, let's be clear about this, every power source has pros and cons. You know, even you know, the wind towers people... Uh, don't want to live near them because of uh, sonic uh, issues with the noise that comes off them or the fact that, that the big blades do kill a lot of birds or whatever. There's, there's pros and cons of everything. Paint the picture first, Kirk. What would it be like uh, to be near one of these plants? To stand next to an operating lifter, uh, you would be hard-pressed to tell that you were standing next to anything other than a, a normal, modest-sized industrial building. Probably your, your main tip-off that something was different about the plant would be the, uh, the security you would see around that building. You would probably see double layer of fencing with razor wire on top, and something would say, well, you know, this doesn't look like a normal building because I can't walk up to it. The security would probably be your biggest sense that, that this was not uh, just like any other industrial building. Because other than that, you wouldn't have much indication that anything was going on in there out of the ordinary. It would not be a particularly tall building, certainly wouldn't be anywhere as tall as the plants we have now, nor would you see the large cooling towers that you typically associate with large nuclear power plants. You might see a, a row of uh, of uh, the kind of smaller force draft cooling towers that you typically see as, as refrigeration units in any large building. You'd see more of them, and, you'd, and if you were a somebody of more of a mechanical engineering bent, you might think, well, my goodness, they've got quite a refrigeration load in here. That essentially would be your only indication that there was anything any different about that building than any other industrial building that you had seen before. Uh, you might hear a low hum, but uh, that's about it. And inside that building, in, a, in a, essentially a, a mainly underground silo, would be the re reactor. 
which would be operating, undergoing these fission reactions and driving a gas turbine. And the gas turbine would be based on a closed cycle of high pressure carbon dioxide that's very, very efficient. It's about half again more efficient than the kind of steam turbines we're using today. And you might also see a switchyard outside the building with electrical connections coming to it that would also be something you think, well, maybe there's a substation here or perhaps there's some sort of power distribution here. But that would be what you would see. As far as from a safety perspective or a zoning perspective, there would be no difference between that and any other building. And if you drove perhaps a half a mile away from the plant, you wouldn't see anything at all. There would be no large towers, nothing visually on the horizon that would obstruct your view that would cause you to think that you had been anywhere near a very, very powerful power plant. So the, these lifters, they operate very hot, um, as I understand it, maybe uh, 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so you're talking about using uh, uh, CO2 as, as a, the driving force to turn a turbine. There's got to be waste heat still. Um, what happens to the waste heat? in this story the same thing that happens in any in any typical uh, industrial facility where you see these large uh, cooling systems that are associated with refrigeration about half of that waste heat is just uh, is just blown up into the air so i mean you would not see any physical structures that didn't look uh, identifiable to you from from common experience uh, the waste heat would not be anything particularly out of the ordinary to, to what you would what you would be looking for in a large building and of course if we if we started to get more clever um, I've learned that waste heat is actually a, an inappropriate term that these cogen plants cogeneration plants that have been put in now the the so-called waste heat is anything but it's a valuable byproduct it's used to heat buildings sometimes drive industrial processes something it's one of the reasons that in my own small local town uh, in Greenfield Massachusetts they were talking about putting in a, um, a biomass plant and and they in their design, they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to have to put all these big cooling towers up because we have all this waste heat. They weren't, they didn't design in that they were going to use that excess heat for anything. They were going to have to cool it uh, with river water. Uh, for, and uh, so so that, that, I think, was one of the main reasons that design got shot down is because they were still thinking of the excess heat is waste heat. And that's like a lot of people said, yeah, that's not that's not modern thinking at this point in time. Yeah, and if that same plant that I had mentioned was close to a coastal area, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't even do that. You would be desalinating seawater with that, as you mentioned, waste heat inappropriately so termed. And you would be producing a large amount of fresh water from what would otherwise be a, a waste product. So even that system could be utilized for, for great value. You had mentioned earlier the idea of clustering habitation around these things. If you happen to be in a more remote place or a cold climate, you would most certainly want to have underground piping that was moving that, again, poorly mentioned, waste heat to heat buildings. This is very common in Europe and in, and in Asia where they will make sure that what would otherwise be waste heat from industrial processes is used for space heating and, uh, and, and, and building heating and house heating. And so then you don't have to go and spend electricity or natural gas doing jobs that can be done with what would otherwise be a waste product. All right, so let's talk, to, let's talk about how, how this gets done then. Um, one of the, one of the uh, critiques I read was, it boils down to this, that the science is easy maybe, but the engineering is hard. Uh, is that, it, where are we in this story? What would be required to, to really advance uh, this thinking to the next level to, to really drive um, this further into out of proof of concept into something we're actually using because I, I would love to live near one of those buildings compared to any other energy source I currently know about. I would too, and it would be a far, far less obtrusive energy source than any other energy source you know about. It would not emit anything that would dirty the air. It would not be visually obstructive. It would not make noise. It would not be subject to the weather, uh, sometimes working and sometimes not working. It would work day and night. Uh, 365 days a year. So it would be a very, very attractive facility to have other industrial activities nearby, whether that's a data center or whether that's a, uh, a housing development or, or a variety of other things. So yes, there are engineering challenges. I'm an engineer, full disclosure. I spent my career developing mm -hmm. technology. Uh, I, I am of two minds of this. When I consider what the lifter can do in terms of global energy demand, global energy production, I consider the engineering challenges 
unbelievably modest when I contrast that with how would we power the world using solar energy or wind energy or conventional nuclear or a host of other things I go my goodness this is orders of magnitude easier to do than that nevertheless I get up every day and I go to work on the engineering challenges of the system and some of them are, are challenging but I don't see anything yet that I don't think will will not yield to uh, sufficient uh, manpower and, and engineering time on the problem uh, our own efforts, of course, are more modest than I would like them to be. I would like to have a, uh, a much larger team of engineers working on the problem, and that is a strict form, <laughs> as a strict function of the funding level that we have. We're entirely privately funded. We don't receive any government funds. Uh, so we go basically as fast as we're funded. And if we had more funding, we could go a lot faster. And so an awful a lot of my time, unfortunately, is, is spent trying to go find that funding that enables us to do the engineering. So um, it can happen just as fast as the engineering takes place, and the engineering takes place just as fast as the funding can be obtained. That's a, a very typical story. Now, you know, when I was um, <clears throat> uh, in China a while back, the, the, the director of the National Grid had just released a study that said, hey, we're pretty sure we can do this alternative energy thing. We'll put the wind towers where the wind is, though, so we'll call that the Arctic Circle, and we'll put the, the solar where the sun is. We'll call that the desert region. So all we need is a, is a grid to sort of get electricity from point A to point B. And uh, they ran some numbers and decided that $50 trillion, that would be a, about what it would take to begin to seriously power the world uh, in this way. So, again, you know, there's uh, the co-location problem of having the power source, which would be the wind up in the Arctic Circle or latitudes, for instance, and then piping that uh, uh, energy, electricity to where it's actually being consumed. Uh, 50 trillion, that's a, just a gigantic number if we're going to try and power uh, ourselves through what we would call a, a globally scaled alternative infrastructure, which I think that number is pointing to the same thing you're pointing to, which is that when you really think through the engineering of what it's going to take to replace quadrillions of BTUs by other means, and you look at the ex existing path we're on, it seems insane to me that we are not also pursuing, with at least some vigor, uh, the path that you're pursuing and other, uh, you know, different alt uh, nuclear technologies as, as, as they are currently uh, understood. It just seems insane to yeah, me. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and, and when I think about what you've just described, a system to accommodate the fact that the wind and the solar energy are not where the people are, and 50 trillion to try to move that electricity around. And then I think of the fact that the amount of thorium that it would take to provide all the energy, all of the energy you would use in your entire life is about the size of a small marble and would fit in your pocket and would cost a few cents. You realize, what should we be moving around? Should we be trying to move electricity or should we be trying to move thorium? Because it's a whole lot easier to move a globally significant amount of thorium around than it is to move these electricity uh, sources uh, or the electricity from these sources to the places where the people need it. A small you, you've seen these plastic totes that you tend to put your blankets or your, your old clothing mm -hmm. in. A plastic tote filled with thorium would power a city for a year. How easy would that be to move around rather than trying to build transmission towers to move electricity around? And the thing about transmission systems, sort of the dirty little secret, is that people hate to see transmission lines just about as much as they hate to see anything else. They don't want to see a power plant, and they sure as heck don't want to see transmission lines, and they're very unpopular to build and site and get installed. And it's a dirty little secret of the people who are advocating wind and solar, Uber all us, that we will require vast, vast new transmission infrastructure to do that. And to make matters even worse, most of the time that transmission structure will go very underutilized if it is built. It will not be carrying its full load of electricity day in and day out, it will be operating at a tiny fraction of what it is designed to do because of the nature of the intermittency of wind and solar. So these are enormous, enormous financial expenses that will have to be laid out across the world to realize what many people consider to be the dream of a wind and solar powered world. I think of it as a nightmare. So let's talk about how this actually uh, gets done then. Obviously funding, funding helps. Is there any 
traction at this point in time? Is there anything my listeners can do to uh, help to begin nudge uh, uh, public money in this direction? Is there any public money? Is there any hope of it? Is anybody focusing on this? Where where is there anything here? that can be done besides, you know, raising simple awareness and hoping something good comes from that. Well, Chris, I spent 10 years at NASA doing technology development on public money, and I developed some very strong opinions during that time. Namely, don't do technology development on public money. It seems like a great idea. It seems like free money. But the reality is when you factor in all the strings and all the delays and all the uncertainties and all the changes in political winds, it turns out to be a bad idea. So I proceeded with my company along the assumption that it is generally a bad idea to pursue public funding for these sorts of things. And I know this is not a popular opinion among many other people. In fact, I've butted heads with more people than I know. But I also come back to I've had the experience of doing technology development on public money, and I do not care to repeat it. This is why we are charting a path like this. So what can your listeners do to help? Well, that depends entirely on their own personal uh, interests, wealth, and risk profile. Uh, There's probably somebody listening to this right now that could do an awful lot to change the story on this, and I'd love to talk to him or her. But I don't think that a public strategy of development is ultimately going to win out. It may may make short-term gains, but in the long run, it always runs on the rocks of of a change in administration or a change in strategy or, you know, this fellow wants blue instead of purple and, and, and just doesn't work out. Well, interesting. Well, it's uh, certainly, I mean, if we were going to uh, put another trillion to bailing out bankers or maybe a, a few billion into, into lifter technology, I, I still, I think I'd choose the, 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 the latter over the former. But uh, with that, it's still it's very exciting, always exciting to talk to you. And, 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 and I, would would that you were in charge, Chris? <laughs> would that you were in charge? <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, but uh, not this year. So at any rate, uh, thank you so much for your time today. This is just fantastic. I I, I want to um, let people uh, know more about this. Uh, I want to direct people to your uh, excellent work as much as possible. Where would people go if they were interested in in uh, finding out more, helping to support this? We are always trying to add resources and understanding and insights to our, our website at flibe-energy.com, F-L-I-B-E-energy.com. And I would also uh, invite people to get in touch with me directly at my email, Kirk F. Sorensen, K-I-R-K-F-S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N at gmail.com. And uh, particularly if you want to know more about this, or if you think that you might be able to help, and please mention that uh, you heard about it on Chris's podcast. Well, fantastic. Thanks for that. Thank you for your time today. And really, thank you for uh, pushing this idea. You know, from my standpoint, wow, we need to begin getting very serious about how we're going to begin transitioning. I think that to the extent people are hoping that uh, Elon Musk is going to magically solve this with a few like extra electric cars uh, on a percentage basis tossed into the mix have not really thought this through so of course that's what we're trying to do at peak prosperity is add the big numbers make sense of it all take a squinty look at it all and say we're going to have to begin doing things very differently than we have in the past so out with the old in with the new or in this case uh in with the old which happens to be new so (laughs) (laughs) well said well said thank you so much for your time today kirk thank you very much chris i appreciate it